uh, Zoom machine learning copy seminar. And for those who have not attended uh, larger talks, uh, now it seems that there's over 50 of us here, which is great. So those who haven't attended larger seminars earlier, we are trying to have this as a normal presentation. So as interactive as possible, though, of course, the ways how we can initiate the interaction are slightly different now for the practical reasons. So in Zoom, if, if you want to ask for the floor, ask, ask a question from the presenter. So you can do that at any time, but please do it so that you click the Manage Participants button in the bottom of the Zoom window. Then you, then you get the pop-up of participants. And there in the bottom of that pop-up, you have a button, raise hand. Click that button and I will be chairing the session. I will be monitoring the raised hands and then give the floor to you. Alternatively, you can write something in the chat, but at least the speaker said that he would very much like to have this in a bit more interactive fashion. So if you want to ask using your mic, that would be very kind of you. And also if you can use the uh, video when you are asking the questions, that would be nice. Then it, is, it gives it a bit of a feel that we are actually in the machine learning copy seminar. But you can choose, but anyway, this would be nice. So the speaker of today is Pekka Martinen, professor at Aalto University, who will be talking about deep learning and electronic health reports for risk adjustment. Uh, welcome, Pekka. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me here. Um, so yeah, so the title of my presentation is Deep Learning and Electronic Health Records for Risk Adjustment. This is a collaboration that we have been doing with uh, with the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare, the DHL, and uh, also the University of Helsinki. Much of the work is done by, by Jokes Kumar, who is a PhD student here at Aalto University. Just to, um, just a second. Just to very quickly give, give, uh, give an overview or, or an introduction to the deep learning, so of course all of we know that deep learning has now been extremely successful in a wide variety of tasks in the recent years. Uh, in the in the upper left corner there is there is a research from Alta from Jakko Lehtinen's group uh, where deep neural networks were used to generate artificial celebrity faces which look extremely real. Other success stories that we've witnessed in the in the recent years, uh, for example. Uh, AlphaGo, we all know that uh, that was long thought to be something that only humans can manage well because it, it requires somehow understanding very complex patterns. But but now now it's it's uh, already already also computers outperform the humans in that as well. Uh, some then then other examples. So for example. Um, automated caption generation. So you might have some images or photos and then automatically generate a corresponding caption. So for example, here you have some people shopping at an outdoor market. And once your model is, is trained, it can learn to produce such caption for, for, for the figure. <clears throat> and word embeddings. So lo lots of uh, analysis has been done in the natural language processing, for example, these word embeddings, which, which then can somehow capture the relationships between different types of words in a text automatically. The idea in deep learning is that you have a very flexible model with multiple layers. Um, so here is the input layer, and then each of the layers uh, is uh, fed as input to the next layer. And so that you start with simple features of your input instances and then learn more and more complex features. For example, if the inputs are images, then first you learn some kind of combinations of pixels and then, then maybe some features of, of the face like the eyes and noses. And in the end, in the final layers, your, your features represent different types of faces. And then it's maybe easy to solve your classification task. Let's say that the classification task is, is to, is to uh, classify these into faces that are smiling and those that are not, there might be a feature that uh, represent, represents that exactly. 
The difference to that traditional machine learning is that the performance of the traditional machine learning plotters at some point, so here we have the prediction accuracy on the y-axis and the amount of data on the x-axis. Uh, so the reason is that when the number of parameters uh, or the complexity of your model is uh, somehow constrained, then once you have learned those parameters, it doesn't really matter how much more data you add to the model. Whereas in deep learning, you can in principle learn more and more complex features when you get more and more data. So, so there is no such, such threshold as is visible in the traditional machine learning. Yeah, so uh, I guess that's all about this slide. I will now discuss a project that we've been doing with the DHL. Um, this is uh, a project that was, or a topic that was uh, quite a bit in the news also uh, one, one or two years ago when, when this uh, reform for social and healthcare was still uh, uh, somehow alive, so so the, the, this risk adjustment, where the goal is to somehow learn a model that can be used to allocate funding in a fair and, and uh, efficient fashion to the healthcare providers in Finland. So, in risk adjustment, money is allocated to healthcare organizers based on the respective patient populations. And there are different ways to do this. For example, one might just pay the total cost of the healthcare but as we know, that is, that is um, very, very uh, expensive and we don't have funding to do that because then there is really no incentive to control cost if everything is paid for. Another way it would be to pay the average cost per person, but there is the problem that uh, if, if some regions, for example, in Finland, have uh, healthier patients, then, then they benefit and then they get an unfair benefit. And some regions that have, uh, for example, more elderly patient population, then they, they sort of are in unfair dis disadvantage. So this would be unfair when some organizers have more costly, costly or like uh, healthier or sicker patients. Then the third way is to use risk adjustment to decide the payment per patient. So what would be the like the expected cost for this patient, and then the same same uh, sim in that way similar patients will be allocated the same amount of funding. So this leads to efficient and fair allocation of resources. And even if the healthcare reform uh, went down in Finland um, last year. Anyway, similar models will be then used to allocate funding to the different regions in Finland. There will be this a bit less than 20 regions uh, with different types of populations, and then they will get their funding based on, on these, or part of their funding based on, on such models. This is a quick overview of the data sets at the THL. So they have um, on here on the x-axis, we have the uh, age of an individual and on the y-axis, we have different types of data sources. So in principle, I think that, that it would take too long to go through this all, but, but uh, in principle, we can cover the whole of life course of an individual using these different data sources. So start, starting from maternity clinic, which tells about the, of, of the health of the individual even before, before they are born, all the way until, until uh, like, um, death register, I guess, in the end is the one that then completes, uh, completes tells about the death of an individual and then all these, all these different registers that fall in between. The central ones are the primary healthcare visits and the care register for healthcare. So these are, these are registers that record encounters with or visits to the, to the healthcare uh, services, for example, encounters with nurses or doctors that happen either inside or outside the hospital, so inpatient and outpatient visits. Recent, recently, a lot of deep learning has been uh, developed for electronic health records. Uh, this is just uh, showing a couple of papers in this in this in this realm. Uh, so so. Uh, I think the goal here is maybe to show that all of these are doing a bit similar types of things. So the goal often is to predict some kind of diagnosis, uh, medication or time of the next visit. So what will happen to the patient in the future? And the inputs are often 
things like diagnosis, medications and procedure codes in the previous visits. And the number of patients that have been used is, is some hundreds of thousands, for example, 200 or 700,000. Uh, I think it's, it's growing all the time and data sets are getting bigger and bigger. But, but in, in principle, that's, that's the idea. Some of these also then include clinical notes, which is like free text description of what happened uh, with the doctor, but, but others are just based on these categorical variables about diagnosis, medication, so on. All of these, um, well, not all, but, but many of these methods are based on a timeline of a patient. So here, here is a timeline of a patient. Here are these um, blue and black uh, boxes. They are some procedure codes, diagnosis terms, and diagnostic terms. So these diagnostic terms are, for example, like a diagnosis. I, I'm not sure if it can also be. I, I think it's not necessarily a, a medication. Medications have different types of terms. But anyway, so you have this timeline of a patient of all the things that has happened to that patient. And the goal is to predict something then after the pr prediction window. This prediction window, so usually you don't include any information um, just before the event that you are trying to predict. And the reason is that if you include, incorporate some very recent information just before the event, then you might uh, like accidentally be uh, communicating the outcome to the model. So for example, let's say that our goal is to predict whether an ICU patient will die soon. And, and if there is some, something like, like taking the ventilators off, which, which might be a very strong indication that, okay, the patient is actually just about to die. So if we include that kind of information to, to, to the model, then, then it makes it very easy. And so we get overly, overly uh, optimistic predictions. These different terms uh, or tokens, I think tokens, events, whatever they are called, are then transformed into numerical vectors somehow. So these uh, event representations and finally these, these all are, are converted into a patient representation which then can be used to produce the pre prediction. Recurrent neural networks is a class of, of deep learning model studies used commonly for, for time series. Here the unobserved states, uh, so, so it has these unobserved states and then some inputs that are given to the model at each, uh, each time point and then the unobserved state is updated based on the current input and the previous hidden state. So in the case of, of uh, risk adjustment modeling, so when the goal is to predict the spending of an individual or the healthcare cost, then these uh, inputs that are given at different time points would be the exactly the diagnosis or the medications, procedures, whatever. And this uh, hidden state would, would, would be some kind of representation of the health status of the patient at that time point. And uh, in the end, the final hidden state would be used uh, to, to predict the spending or give a prediction of the spending and that can be then of course compared with the observed spending for this individual uh, to, to, uh, to formulate some kind of loss function and then we can train the model to learn the best, best uh, way to learn these health statuses such that they are as predictive as possible about the, about the spending for, for the individual. Okay, so uh, then to the specific project that we've I have been a doing. Question on, on yes, please. How about attention models? I think we will come to that. Yes, I, I think um, attention models. So we we will incorporate some aspects of of attention here. It's it's uh, like a combination of RNNs and attention. But of course, then you could have like fully attention-based models, which I think is a very promising. Uh, transformers, for example, like GPT. Exactly. Yes. Or so it's okay. a very promising thing to to explore uh, in the future in more detail. And I think others others are also exploring this, and so are we. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and the really question is about is your data set big enough? I, I think um, we will come to that also. So we will have a we will have a 
uh, results which demonstrate the impact of the number of input points. Uh, I think this is now, well, is, is the data set big enough? Let's first start by uh, discussing how big it is. So, so this is now the data set that we have currently available uh, or we had available for, for this, this stage of the project. So, um, uh, so these are now the basic statistics of the data set we have. We are now covering here seven years from 2012 to 2018. And the number of unique patients is 1.4 million. This is uh, roughly um, all uh, Finnish individuals aged 65 or more. So, so this is like a, uh, this this cohort was selected because these these are individuals who are responsible for the biggest costs, obviously, and so that that's why it makes sense to focus on this 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 age group in particular. Of course, then in the end, it's possible to do some kind of stratified analysis where you analyze different age groups separately or maybe combine all of them jointly. Number of visits, well, these, these are like really, these are now taken from just one of those registers, this Avohilmo, which is about um, outpatient visits, basically when, like a healthcare center, if, if an individual visits a healthcare center, that's, that's what, what they are about. So there are like uh, three, 300 million such uh, visits. Average number of visits per patient is, is 280. And the average number of codes recorded per visit is, is three, roughly like a couple of visits. So then there are these visits where you have really many codes recorded by the doctor or, or like the healthcare personnel of 47. These ICD-10 and ICPC-2 codes are, are like diagnosis codes, different types of diagnosis codes, and, um, and then we have different types of procedure codes also. So, uh, so like the input vector, or the, the, like we have these categorical input variables and the dimension of that uh, input vector is, is roughly 13. 13 or 14,000, if, if you sum all of these ICD, ICPC and the procedure codes. This is now an overview of our model and, and I will discuss it a bit in a bit more detail and then. then um, so we start with the patient data here. We have these different time points for each patient. And then this, this one time point corresponds to one visit to the hosp uh, hospital or healthcare center. And then at each visit, we have multiple codes recorded to the, to the register. So this is now the intra-visit axis. These are the different codes recorded at this particular visit. And then we have different types of patient demographics on top of that, like age and gender and such. The first thing that we do here is we learn the code embedding. So this is a way to transform each individual code into a low dimensional, lower dimensional embedding, similar to what we have in these, in these uh, work to back or such, such uh, embeddings in natural language processing. So, so in, in a similar way, because our input vectors are these 14,000 dimensional one hot uh, one hot vectors. Uh, so basically one element is one and all the other elements are zero corresponding to that categorical variable. So we first map those 14,000 dimensional vectors into a lower dimensional space. I actually don't now remember, I think it's maybe 200 dimensional, this, this low di lower dimensional embedding. And the purpose of this, this embedding is to, because some of the diagnoses obviously are, are related. So now learning by learning this embedding, we, we would hope to see similar diagnosis somehow grouped together or grouped close to each other in this lower dimensional embedding. So what, what we have then is um, uh, for each individual, we have these um, T time points. And from each time point, we have the D dimensional uh, embedding of the code. And then we have multiple codes, so it's this intra-visit axis, so the third dimension. 
The second embedding that we use here is to is uh, to com the purpose of that second embedding is to combine these different codes from the single visit into a single embedding, like a visit specific embedding. So intra visit convolutional embedding layers. This is a one by one convolution that is then used to combine these different codes in a single visit into a single code. I will have more details about that on the next slide. And so what we now have, we have D time points and we have the D dimensional embedding for each time point for each visit. And then we fed to feed those D time points into a recurrent neural network. <coughs> so we have these um, uh, two layers of, of LSTM, which is a standard recurrent neural network. And then we explored a little bit with different types of architectures here. So, uh, so like the standard LSTM, and then we tried, you know, initial experiments, we tried the bidirectional LSTM. The benefit of the bidirectional LSTM is that when you look at the sequence in two different directions, um, also the visits earlier on in the sequence get sort of, they are not forgotten so easily. And we, we noticed that that's beneficial for the prediction accuracy. Nevertheless, training those bidirectional um, bidirectional RNNs was uh, time consuming. And so then we considered this alternative. So instead of having another RNN going to the other direction, we added this attention layer here that can then attend each state of the LSTM model and, and then learn to focus on specific specific visits and, and in this way we achieve the same same uh, benefits as from the bidirectional RNN so so we can actually attend also or focus also on the on the visits early on in the sequence but this is also much faster to train than the bidirectional RNNs. Then like like Leo Leo was here saying that we have these transformer based models which actually are based only on the attention uh, uh, and, and, and don't really assume this uh, time series structure as, as an RNN. Uh, so we considered those also. So far, I think we the results we've got haven't been better, have actually been a bit worse. But I, like I said, I think that is something that that is certainly worth worth exploring. Okay, the size of your data set, I actually understand that. Sorry? The, the size of the data set is, is, is too small for, for transform. I think, I think this is, this is one, yeah, sure, I, I agree, yes. So then uh, like this RNN in the sense that it assumes this time series structure uh, is like a, maybe, maybe the method of choice. Okay, so then I think I have um, sufficiently much time that I will go through some of the details of this model. So for uh, first this, um, like this, uh, one by one convolution. So, so, uh, so, how to handle this thing that we have multiple codes per visit? So, one by one convolution basically is just. Um, uh, I think it's um, like a fully connected network that maps. Like here, we have this intra-visit dimension. So, we just multiply each element in that dimension with this this vector. And that, and then apply a nonlinearity, and that gives us this one-dimensional, uh, one-dimensional uh, sort of uh, output in the end. So this is this is used uh, to combine channels in in image, uh, or reduce the number of channels in image image models. So that's where this comes from. Of course, it doesn't have to be so that you immediately map from the high dimensional to the one dimensional. You might have these intermediate dimensions like where we have these 16 dimensional intermediate steps and in the end, the one dimensional thing. So the motivation for doing this, I, I think um, what others, others have done previously is just take the simple summation across the codes in a single visit. And we tried that. Um, I think um, what that neglects is that there is some information also in the uh, in the ordering of the codes, how they are recorded per visit. For example, the doctors are strongly, well, not strongly, but they are encouraged to record the primary diagnosis in the first as the first code. 
So even if this is not really enforced by these registers, there is some, some structures are that like you have the primary diagnosis code in the beginning and so on. So, so all of these positions are not sort of um, uh, equally valuable in terms of information. And, and that's why this now this when giving or learning the weights for the different, uh, different uh, positions in this, in, this, uh, in this vector then helps giving more emphasis to those, those, uh, those positions that actually matter. Then also this adds flexibility uh, and, and speeds up training quite significantly, like by, by 30, or, 30 or 40 percent. I think the number, at least the number of, number of epochs required for the model to converge. Then, uh, the other detail that I have here is just for those who have not, who are not so familiar with these attention models. Uh, I don't really have time to explain this in, in much detail, but just to give a very, very quick idea what's happening here. So let's say that this is now taken from, from a really nice block uh, uh, that explains the transformers and the self attention. So let's say that our input has now here two words. Now in our model, the, the inputs are these, uh, states of the RNN in different time steps. But here it might be like thinking machines and then you have the embeddings for those two inputs. So what this self-attention does is that it learns for each input, uh, there is a matrix and you multiply the original embedding three matrices so that you get a query key and value for each input here. And then the idea is then to learn how the values of the different inputs should affect the output for this particular time point. And that is done so that you, we have now this query for time point one, we compare, compare that with the key from all other time points. So key from the first time point, key from the second time point. We take the multiplication of the query and the key. Uh, that gives us some number which we normalize. So then in the end, in this, in this uh, toy example, we get that this, uh, when, when learning updated embedding for this first position, this original word should have weight 0 0.88 and the other, other word should have weight 0 0.12. And then we just basically multiply the corresponding value with the weight and then take a summation. And that gives us now uh, like the updated embedding for this time point and the same thing is that here we are not really assuming any any uh, time ordering so it's really so that you just have this query and key for each time point and you compare and, and how well those match then you can give the specific time point more emphasis when a learning what should come out of this time point. And in a similar way, what we do here is we have this multi, and it's now multi-headed in the sense that we do this multiple times in parallel and then compare, compare the, uh, like combine the outcomes and also then in the end combine all the outcomes and then, uh, then map those uh, into the same uh, dimension as the output of the LSTM and then combine those. Uh, I think I, I don't exactly now remember the details here. I think it's like a summation and then some, some, uh, uh, some fully connected layers to, to produce our final prediction then in the end. Okay, uh, then I just have some results and then I'm, I think I'm, I'm done. So, so this is now results about the prediction accuracy. The task, task was here to predict the number of visits to a doctor uh, in the next year. Uh, this is a good proxy for the, for the amount of spending. It's of course not exactly the same thing as spending for this individual. What we did here is that we tried to predict um, uh, the number of visits in 2016 and then this is the number of previous years that we included as input to the model. The output was some visit from 2016 and then, that then we have had a test, test set of course. This LSTM model is now the one that we, we introduced here. Then the number of training points is, is varied from 10,000 to half a million here. And we see that as we would expect that this uh, neural network approach 
the more you have data, the better, better your results are. Especially this lasso, which, which is a simple uh, parametric model uh, quickly. I, it doesn't really matter how much data you give it. It's, it's, it's about as good with 10,000 training points as with half a million. And this light GBM is, is a tree-based ensemble ensemble method and it works well and it, it's it only uses the counts of different events it doesn't it doesn't use the time structure and we see that uh, the more data you have the better the neural network is in in relation we actually had even even a bigger data set this is this is just still a subset of data like this half a million and three years but we when we do, did the whole thing um, the analysis using the whole data set and the, the difference was even even greater. All of these differences actually are, are highly significant in, in terms of this like conventional statistical significance in the sense that um, that our, our test set is so so big here. I think it's about 100,000 individuals so, so all of the differences are really really real in that in that sense. This is now obviously if we train a model in order to allocate spending and we want to use it to allocate spending next year so we don't have any data available from next year at the time of training the model that, uh, so so this is now uh, an experiment that we did to explore the ability of the models to generalize to, to new years so um, so here what what was used as input so we trained the model to predict uh, here is is uh, the, let's say let's take this right hand side so we trained the model to predict year 2016 when it was given the input from um, 13 14 and 15 so trained on three previous years to predict 2016 so then we had some data from 2016 available but then we used the same model to predict 2017 uh, using input data from three previous years and 2018 again using input data from three previous years so that we didn't have any data from 17 while at the time of predicting to the year 17 and so on so we see that this lstm actually uh, very well um, maintains its ability to predict it actually even increases a bit but i think this is just an artifact or like a random random variation in the data sets but but i, I so so it, it it maintains pretty well its ability to predict even 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 to new years where there is no data uh, whereas these these other models that the other other uh, tree based model uh, goes down a bit the lasso is also because it's so so sort of simple and robust so it maintains also its ability to generalize very well um yeah i guess that's all i had to say about this figure then one thing that that we can of course now or, or like um, the argument that we can make is uh, look, okay, one, one argument is how good is this 0 0.3 in R squared really? Is that good? Is that something that is like good enough that we could use it? Um, so, and the other one is that if we have two models and one has R squared 0 0.32 and the other one has R squared 0 0.35, so is that like a difference that we should really care about? Uh, to answer the first question, so how good is this really? Uh, I think this is about as good as what uh, uh, other countries are using at the moment. So, uh, so I, I think that's 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 uh, like the answer that this is the level of accuracy that has been that 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 has been uh, achieved also in other countries using similar data sets and, and models and, and actually the, those other countries are then using these models of course one of the things to not point out here is that we focused already on the on the like the age cohort 65 or more so so uh, that is all already like if, if we actually include all the age cohorts we are likely to get higher higher accuracy because because then all the all the age age groups have so strongly varying cost predicted costs then the other question is okay 
suppose that this is now or one of these models is is good enough or we anyway have to use one and then then some model is better than no model so what is really the difference but Pekka, in using so even if you would include all age cohorts in in your study then they are similarities anyway that could actually help as a, as an auxiliary task to, to to have better result in in each of those age uh, kind of cohorts separately yeah i i agree i i think um uh, I agree fully. So, so this is this is uh, something that we are considering for sure. Yeah, uh, it's also it's not just that. Uh, yeah, I think I think we need to start with some subset of the data anyway. So, so it's not feasible to sort of uh, start with all data. I mean, I mean, what what would that even mean? And, and that's not even available for this type of studies. So, so we need to start with the subset and this was the, like the sensible subset, subset. But I agree that including all the, all the cohorts at the same time would be like, would likely help here. Yes. Anyway, so this is now comparing the difference in predictions for individuals. So, so supposing that we are using this to allocate funding and the funding is, is somehow tied to the prediction. Uh, so, so like double the prediction, maybe double the money. Money. It, it's not. It's not going to go like this in practice. But, but I mean, there is. There is a. That's the idea for for learning these models. So, if we look at on the individual level, what's the difference in the predictions? So, when we compare, for example, LSTM to the lasso. So, this is now a histogram. The the blue one is a histogram of the relative difference of the predictions so we see that even if even if well uh, well let's let's compare to the lgbm because that was quite close to the lstm so even if these two models were relatively close in terms of their global r squared then we see that there might be easily like a hundred percent difference in the prediction if we look at those prediction on the individual level and obviously um to some extent these average out if we are using this to allocate funding to like a some group some region sufficiently large region in finland but the thing is that the regions are different so so it's not like a random random subset uh, but, but actually uh, so so you might be able to identify groups subgroups in the population such that systematically one model predicts more or less to that subgroup and of course then if if the goal is in the end to allocate uh, I, I guess we are talking about billions of euros anyway here so so such um, such differences might quite rapidly translate into uh, tens or hundreds of billions of, of allocation so it is really not like a, okay yes let's use one or the other because they seem to be as good uh, anyway so you, one really needs to think what is the implication of using one or the other model on the level of the whole population and on the, on the level of the subgroups and are there some subgroups and, and and like is it really justified that for some subgroup we now suddenly increase the funding or, or decrease it so these types of questions are quite quite significant and and, and it really makes a difference in practice well, which model to use uh, i might point out here that these models are not i mean this is so far this is academic research so so the models that that the national uh, or the finnish institute for health and welfare is developing for for these these methods they are sort of simpler at the moment they have the interpretability and, and so on aspects that are very important also which which of course neural networks lack at least to some extent and and and, and because it's it's very important to be able to communicate these results and explain the reasons like why why for example some allocation is, is changed money allocation is changed or so on and that's why that's why for the moment that, that that's the kind of models that are used in finland but then nevertheless i think this is if if um, we are developing this in collaboration with those people and and, and uh, who knows if if sort of in the end uh we would we would be using some combination maybe of these models models to to do this decision making but that's of course then up to up to the politicians in the end to decide how to how to allocate the money it's not up to up to us 
I think I'm. I have now five minutes time. I will. I will skip the future extension and I will skip also the other uses for the models uh, and just uh, thank thank you. And then then I think I, I was uh, asked to reserve a little bit of time in the end to to have floor for discussion. So so I think now we have five minutes left. Okay, I have a short question. Mm -hmm. So this R squared 0 0.3, it looks very little. It's not really a good prediction, right? Uh, well, I, I think um, I, it, it really depends. Like I said, we have these different, this is now already like a restricted age group. So actually, if we had multiple age groups, we would get a much higher, higher one. So this is like predictions within that age group, which we already know to be quite, uh, quite, uh, uh, like a high high cost age group, but I like and also I, like I said, I think these these are the types of models that other countries are using. Actually, they have even much simpler models, and and then those models predict less. But yeah, I agree. Lots of there is a lot of variation that is not explained by this model or any of the models. Yes. So Satari Yukarainen has a question, and and the others, please raise a hand if you want to ask a question so that we don't speak at the same time. Yeah, hey, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, I'm a postdoc at FIM for Andrea Ghana. So is there like the practical goal to estimate primary care level costs or like total healthcare costs? Uh, I think, um, how, how was it now? I think these, these models, the models that the DHL is developing are, I may not, no, not say it correctly, but I think these are now meant to be used to allocate funding for the primary health care uh, in the first place. I think the special health care is, is funded differently. This is my understanding, but it might be not exactly correct. And of course, like also the, for the primary health care, this is not like the whole budget, but this is just part of the budget and how, how, they, how this affects. But like I said, I'm not, I don't really remember the details. Yeah, yeah, okay, thanks. Because the, then the number of doctor visits, it's probably a good proxy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. So, so the, maybe like the number, of, I mean, if it's about hospitalizations or something like this, then of course those are also very costly. They might not fall into this, 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 uh, this prediction task or this, I, I, I mean this, maybe this, like this part of the budget. Yeah, thanks. Other questions? While you are thinking, I okay. Oleg, please go ahead. Um, yes, hi, my name is Oleg. I'm a master's student. I just want to ask, like, uh, based on that pipeline you showed in the beginning, uh, was there some kind of uh, uh, preparing the data, like nominal detection? Because I guess there is also a huge amount of noise should be because, uh, like, like how are you? Yes. I, I see. So, like the no data is extremely noisy. Uh, so that that is, of course, one of the things to just realize from from the beginning that the data is really noisy. So, um, so you have actually like incorrect entries. I like, for example, I have had entries in my Kanta register. I mean, everybody can check their what what is in their Kanta, but I have I had entries about some like dental visits that I have I certainly have not had so like it's possible that like the doctors just record uh, like to, to a wrong patient maybe or they might record uh, completely wrong diagnosis so they just misspell the diagnosis code things like this and of course different doctors um, record different codes use different codes codes differently and uh, then there are changes over years. These, these coding systems are updated. All of these things. Um, so I guess we did some initial sort of quality checking. Uh, we didn't really focus much on, on cleaning the data set as much as possible. I think that is something that is um, well, I guess it's a bit maybe outside the scope of this type of deep learning project. Uh, of course, it's highly relevant 
and important to do when and if these models are to be used in practice. Uh, but, but so far, um, well, I would say that there is a lot of room for improvement in that in that respect, for sure. All right, thank we you. We are running. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we are running out of time soon. But uh, Jing, if you have a very short question, go ahead. Oh yes, uh, this is Jing. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, my question would be: If you look at the uh, patient with different disease, uh, like uh, uh, separately, whether you will uh, see some disease are easier to predict this uh, number of visits than any mm. other diseases. Yeah, so I think this is this is again uh, like I might say that like how how these models are used in different countries. So there are these models that are uh, stratified by the age group, for example, or by different cohorts. So you have different models for different cohorts, and of course, one the other way to somehow split this problem into 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 sub sub pieces is to have different models for different diseases. I think one one type of, oh, I mean, there are some diseases, maybe some diseases are sufficiently different that it makes sense to model those, those separately. Uh, like, for example, many, many countries have um, a separate model for, for uh, mental health uh, spending for some reason. And, uh, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure why, why, but I guess it's like sufficiently separate and, and sufficiently uh, costly that it, it makes sense to model that separately. For sure, I guess there will be, will be some things that are easier to predict than some others. For example, if it's a very, some very rare disease, it would be very difficult to predict. Whereas if it's the, like the average number of flus that some individual will have, uh, or, or, or let's say, when, especially when we average over the regions, like the total number of flus next year in this region. Well, I guess like we've seen already this year, unfortunately, that it's not always easy to predict that either. But, but, but in general, like some common things that you have, uh, that many people have, uh, it, it's, it will be very, very uh, well easier to predict than some rare, rare diseases, for sure. Okay. I think we are out of time, so warm thanks to Pekka for the excellent talk and everybody stay tuned. We have some uh, difficulty sorting out the rest of the talks because of the special conditions, but we will announce all the talks in the, uh, in the mailing list and on the website, of course. Thanks all for joining. Thank you.